Well, greetings everyone. This is Jyoti Dodia and welcome to the 115th session in the PowerVerk technical webinar series. We're back after a bit of a long break, uh, which is due to some work commitments and also some vacation on my part. Um, so we will we'll be back to normal sessions very, very soon as of today. So um, th just a reminder that this session is being recorded and a replay and a slide deck will be made available. And you can find details of this and all past sessions on the PowerVerk info page um, at ibm.biz slash PowerVerk. So before we begin um, today's session, I just wanted to uh, say a few words about Gareth Coates. Um, now, some of you will know um, that Gareth, uh, our Gareth Coates, our friend and colleague, um, passed away sadly on the 15th of June um, this year. And he was always very ready to help everyone and kept us all amused with his great sense of humor. Um, a technical guru who shared his vast knowledge on many a PowerVerk session and at TechUs and other similar events. He will be very, very dearly missed. And I'm sure that if he were here today, he would have loved to get his hands on the Power 10 system and test things alongside Nigel Griffiths, who is our speaker today. Nigel is going to take us on a tour of the Power 10 S1024 system and the EBMC and a new version of the HMC. Um, so before I hand over to Nigel, I just wanted to tell you a little bit about some events that are coming up. So please bear with me. And While you're doing that, I've got the same blue t-shirt on as Gareth had in that picture. Ah, yeah. lovely. Yeah, and we do miss him. He was so useful. <laughs> yes, indeed. And I'm sure many of you will um, feel the same. So, um, just talking through the power of a uh, technical webinar series. Uh, hopefully, all of you who've joined today are familiar with the with the series and I've just flashed up the PowerWork info page where you can find details of upcoming sessions as well as replays of past sessions. So the previous one to this was all about open source software and IBMI integration techniques. Um, and there's been several uh, sessions before, as you can see. And the replays for these sessions are also available on the uh, a YouTube channel, uh, which I share with the other uh, virtual user group, the Power Systems virtual user group. Um, but you can see there's uh, many sessions uh, that have been recorded. And if I look at the full playlist of all the um, Power VUG sessions, um, you, you'll see uh, almost all of them are on here. And the ones that were set up earlier in the series were, uh, are also available for downloading. They weren't on the YouTube channel at the time. Um, another thing that I wanted to just reference very quickly before we move on is a, an event that IBM UK are running, our power systems team in the UK. We're running a session on the 13th of September, on the afternoon of 13th of September uh, at IBM London offices in York Road. Uh, and this session will be covering um, lots of hot topics to do with Power 10, all around Power 10, but more of a um, see, hear, and engage feel. So um, demos, show, not tell kind of um, feel to the event. So there'll be lots of um, time available for demos. You can, I will send the links to this registration page in the replay email I send afterwards, and you can see the agenda of what the thing, what we're going to be covering then. So I hope you can join if you're in London or around or can get to it. I uh, hope that you can join us. Um, another uh, set of series that you may find useful if you're in IBM I um, world, then IBM I Merlin guided tours is a set of webcasts, a set of four webcasts, three of which have run already in August, but they're going to be repeated in September. The fourth one actually is today, 
um, but all of these sessions are going to be repeat, repeated and also they are available as recordings for you to replay at your leisure. Um, and these are going through uh, you know, everything to do with Merlin, but also some background information before going into Merlin, um, you know, what is the ICD? So could be very useful for um, developers in your teams. Uh, and also IBM Systems UK have also been running some brunch and learn sessions. So I won't go into too much detail here, but watch out for the replay links for all these sessions uh, in uh, the replay email that I send later on. Likewise, the IBM I user group are running a session in November, 3rd of November in uh, Wolverhampton and IBM Think 2022 is on tour and um, the London event uh, is on the 15th of September. So it, this Think on Tour is going around very many different countries, so um, or very many different cities. So um, maybe look at the one local to you. So thank you for um, listening to that and I will hand over to Nigel. Just one second. There we go. Nigel, you have control. Okay. I was forget to hit the share button. There we go. And I hope you can you can see that. Yes. In full screen mode. Now, yes. Okay, so we'll be looking at the new Power Ten scale out model, but one particular one. That's the. <laughs> It's the top of the bottom of the range. You'll see what I mean on another chart in a minute. The S1024. And I, I've had one of these for uh, five or six months now in my uh, development lab in London. And, uh, I, and we're going to have a look, a deep dive into it. So I'm going to, uh, when it first arrived, I took it all apart and took lots of pictures of it. And that's what you're going to look at, give you a detailed look of what's inside the, mo inside the box. The, um, th these days, um, smaller customers may know their machines. They go into the computer room and, and make changes. A lot of big company have um, other people that do that, and um, they actually action other people yet again to actually go into the computer room and make changes. So they, nobody really sees their computers. I mean, whenever I can, I go to my computer room and give them a quick polish because I love them because they're really good things and uh, they're good for my career and that sort of thing. So. Quite often you find that customers, one, they've never actually seen the machine, and two, they've certainly not looked inside and taken bits out of it because you're not meant to do that after it's uh, set up and running, of course. Um, we're going to look at the well, the HMC 10 um, user interface a little bit and the eBMC. This is the new service processor. So it's a quite a bit, bit of a hands-on deck this time. And so this is the order, running order. Uh, I got slit signed. Reminder of the actual the 1024, then we've got the deep dive, HMC, BMC, and then we'll look at some uh, questions uh, later on. Now, this is what I was going to put right at the end, but of course, some people can't make it right to the end and they'll miss this and they'll never know because there's a lot of information out there already. So in yellow, you're watching the, the power of Argan. Yes, the recording will be made available and uh, we'll be able to download that usually a day or two. Um, in the uh, August the 4th, the other virtual user group team, the, we, we tend to call them the American one because uh, they're based in America. Um, I ran a session there that we looked at the scale out and the mid range machines, and that was looking at all the, the facts and features, you know, the number of CPUs, the cores, the um, ad adapters in there, the disks in there, and what you need if you want to configure one up and decide how big a machine you want. So you can go and have, find that. Um, I, they actually um, uploaded the PowerPoint, so you can pull it down and, and take all the pictures out of it and things like that, if that's uh, useful for you. Then we had so many questions on that event that we're actually going to have another event on September the 8th, uh, which is a frequently asked questions. And we have frequently asked questions internally, so we're going to put those out there. If you know two or three people have asked me the same question, we're going to put that uh, in the frequently asked questions a session and maybe some of the questions from today if we can't answer them quickly can be put into that i've got uh, seven youtube videos on power 10 servers that you can go and pick up the 
Red books are available. They've been um, updated regularly uh, every other week for a couple of months now. So any of the things that were a bit vague or un uncertain have been fixed up. And so they're pretty good and solid now. They're not changing very much. And I, well, I actually use this myself. I have a, a, a web page down at the bottom there, which is my one stop shop. So it links to all the things I can find. So uh, the actual announcements, they're pretty boring, but they're there. I have my infographic slides, which is 10 slides that tries to cover everything in the entire range with little pictures and words. Um, Red book links in there, uh, my videos, articles, and the, the famous performance report, the Power 10 performance report, which gives you all the um, R perf values, the relative performance index, um, or the CPW for the IBM I uh, interested people. So that's, that's one place you can go to find all this uh, information. So we're now, well, in July, uh, we announced and it went GA that started shipping uh, at the end of July, um, the Power 10 range. We have the complete range available now. You can see the dates down there. The E1080 came out in September last year. That was the first one out the door. And uh, we're very proud of these machines. Um, now, it looks like there's four machines in here, but the scale out is actually coming in six different flavors. Uh, the the S 1024 is the biggest one, it's the 4U, uh, maximum numbers of CPUs and memories that goes into that. Then some people prefer something not quite as powerful, but goes into YouTube, because you can put a lot of them in, sorry, in, uh, two U, um, uh, in, in a 19 inch rack. So you get a lot of them in a rack. And there's some other models I'm just putting down there, bottom there, the S1024 is like the, a cut down 24. Uh, so the 14 is a cut down 24 um, if you would need minimum uh, amounts of compute and uh, memory. And that actually will let you let run um, the Oracle Standard Edition 2 and get the cheaper version of Oracle to run on that. There's also an S1022S, which is a cut down 22. And uh, again, just for a smaller machine. And then we have two Linux versions of the 24 and the 22. Um, almost exactly the same spec, but the, the terms and conditions are different. So you, with the Linux machines, you can't um, have um, capacity on upgrade on demand type facilities in, in that machine. You have to have all the CPUs switched on on day one. Um, but it says Linux mostly because for some reason, IBM was really generous and said, OK, you buy this to run Linux, but you may have one or two uh, uh, AIX or IBM I virtual machines you also want to run them on the box maybe you know that's running the database or something and then the other virtual machines are running the the application workloads um so you, up to 25 percent of the cpus are allowed to run ax or ibm I in any combination you like so we're not going to cover those they were covered in great detail the, in the last uh, virtual user group just a little reminder there so here here's my five or six slide reminder um Big jump in performance, you know, 2.3 uh, nearly times in performance. So if the Power 9, um, 924 was doing 100 miles an hour, uh, this is now doing 228 miles an hour. You know, it's a big jump in performance. And we're doing that by using dual chip models, modules inside the machine. So we actually have double the number of um, power chips inside the same uh, chassis. And that allows you to run far, your applications faster. You can reduce your, your uh, data center footprint, have half the number of boxes to run the same workload. And of course, if you've got bigger, faster CPUs, then you can need less CPUs, which can reduce your software licenses if it's based on the number of cores that is actually activating, active on. Um, memory, uh, so this is a CPU, isn't it? Yeah. Um, 3.9 to 4 gigahertz. I already mentioned dual chip modules and things. You can buy it in 12, 24, 32, or 48 um, CPU core configurations. You can have some of those switched off as uh, you know, dark cores and switch them on later on by paying the, uh, the extra money for the activations. Then we have the new fancy memory. It's called OMI or Open Memory Interface. Uh, we decided that DDR4 is what's the current machine that are running in uh, servers. Uh, there are some little um, machines that run uh, DDR5 now, but it's still very expensive. But we decided it's not fast enough for what we need in this generation of servers. So it's, it's got the same chips you can see on the picture on the left, 
Um, but the controller and the interface is much faster. It's buffering and it does transparent encryption of everything that goes into memory. That's the little gold heat sink that's got the controller underneath it there. But a lot faster so we can feed our new fast CPUs. In the scale out, we now have four Power 10 um, chips in two sockets and they're completely cross connected. So it's a one hop design. If one Power 10 needs to get to something in a, in a cache line in another processor, it can go directly to it and get that data immediately back. It doesn't have to hop around the machine to get there. So it's a very level flight playing field for SMP type um, machine design. Then we have the adapters in the back. These now have uh, mostly a Gen 5 capability that doubles the performance on the bandwidth. Unfortunately, there's not a um, lot of adapters that will run uh, Gen 5 at speeds. When you actually power up the slot with the adapter in, the machine and the adapter negotiate how fast the, the actual adapter is. And so it'll go back down to Gen 3 or Gen 4. Three, uh, Gen 4, Gen 3, and Gen 2, if necessary, if you've got some really old adapters that are in the slot. We expect Gen 5 adapters to come out um, in due course, certainly for the, the five-year lifetime until we get to uh, the next generation of power processors. Uh, that allows us to run um, you know, your fiber channels and your networks at much higher speeds and uh, lower latency. That's the point of Gen 5. We also have remote I.O. drawers, the same as the previous generation, to, to expand it out. Inside the machine, we have no SAS disks. They're gone. Old-fashioned disks and old-fashioned way of connecting them. We now run the NVMEs. The actual disk technology itself is SSD, so they're nice and fast. The NVMe is a much faster connection than we can get with the SAS drives and SAS controllers. So they're, they're easily all capable of doing it in a million I.O. ops a second, and we can put 16 of them into the front of the uh, 1024. So that there's the, the, the basics. Um, and before we go and have a look in a second, uh, 48 CPU cores, uh, 8 terabytes of memory. It's quite frightening, isn't it? Uh, 16 uh, SSD NVMe drives, and we've got 10 PCI slots, uh, including Gen 5 in most of them. So we've got faster performance, more reliable. Um, every generation of our machine is more reliable than the previous one. That's, that's one of the build characteristics of all our machines. If you do a light for light comparison, so if you make a Power 9 machine that has a 1,000 RPERFs and a Power 10 machine, which will have the same performance, a uh, 1,000 RPERFs, then you'll find it's actually a lower price. So you can go faster or you can go cheaper, depending on which way you want to, uh, to manage your resources. And we have all the, the modern flexible um, management, cost management, dark cores. We can use the CMC to instantly turn on and charge you by the minute for your CPU and memory, for example. And we have all the modern uh, tooling systems like uh, Ansible for rolling out large volumes of machines in your on-premise cloud-like environment. Right, so let's look at it in detail. Here's a picture. This is, isn't my one. <laughs> this is a uh, marketing picture very high resolution that uh, I'm surprised if nobody asks us why what are these four blobs around run, running around outside the uh, the 10 there but we'll come back to that perhaps later at the end now this is an early ship machine an ESP type machine uh, they are lent loaned to people around the world like myself who do lots of early testing give them feedback we can generate uh, videos and presentations and answer lots of questions of people that uh, as they become available for uh, selling uh, that's the, the idea of them uh, they're not often not quite the GA the generally availability level of a server that we'd actually sell you uh, later on in actual fact there's only one tiny little piece that's missing on, on my machine that makes it non-GA and um, so it is pretty good uh, it was well advanced in the development cycle before they sent it to me and uh, it's, it's quite an impressive little machine we've had it since April so here, here it is arriving if you, <laughs> if you don't get involved with things arriving like this it's on a pallet it's a big box um, I'm getting old these days and I start taking the cellophane and the black, uh, the, the brown uh, uh, tape off to undo the box. And I forget 
you should attack these white blobs in here. You push the center in, it releases it, and then you can lift the entire top of the box off the server and keep the keep it as a box that you can use later on, perhaps. So we look inside, we got the big long boxes, the rack rails, we've got a cable management arms like a bigger one. Uh, remember this is an ESP machine. So, so the jokers in the in the transport sent us some power eight documentation. <laughs> this is a practice run really, but uh, it wasn't very useful. Uh, and then we uh, take that uh, inner cardboard box off and we can actually say, see the machine all carefully uh, wrapped up with um, the uh, big fungi spongy foam and a, a plastic bag around that to, to keep the humidity out. Um, and we have to break this uh, connector uh, to actually open the box to get it in. There it is. If you when you actually open it up, the top of the box is some nice pretty pictures. It's got uh, stuff on the front, the cardboard uh, that will protect all the uh, discs and uh, knobs and things at the front. And same again for the, the access to the back of the machine. Now, there was a time when I used to complain that why don't they send a machine with a, like a card that you could pull out at any point to, to remember the numbering convention for the, the, the way the adapters are. You know, which one is adapter one uh, and which is disc six and, and these days they put it on top of the uh, the lid and so this is a detailed view of uh, what's going on and how to do things they give you recommendation we can't see a picture here of how many people um you need to lift the box I minutes mean, on the next picture let's even look at uh, telling you about the uh, the battery uh and the, for the time of day clock and, and where it sits it's in here and so you have to replace it. It's readily available if you can uh, open the lid. Uh, but we're not going to go into that in a great deal. It's worth studying at least once because then you know it's there and you don't have to go and find the documentation when it says, you know, adapter three needs replacing. You can actually find out where that is in the pictures. And that's got a slightly, slightly bigger pictures of those two. One thing you'll notice in Power 10, everything's numbered from zero. Uh, it used to be, you know, that. Um, you know, the adapters would start with one, but the uh, memory would start with zero and things like that. But they all start from zero now. And so that's a useful, uh, now a new standard that we stick to. We put it on the uh, nice strong desk and you can see various views of it here. A reminder here to use an electrostatic strap um, to earth yourself. And of course, you shouldn't really be going into the machine and lifting the lid unless it's... Um, already on the rails and in a rack so it's nicely earth that uh, we took special uh, procedures to make sure it was earth before we started touching it so here's a first look um, a little bit grayed out in the top picture but it all looks uh, perfectly functional some of my earlier ship machines don't have the front fascia plate on them because that's always a, a late thing to arrive in the development cycle Bottom right, we can see the uh, four power supplies. We'll look at all of these in details and the adapters. Uh, one thing you can notice here, this is the EBMC, just to the right of the power supplies. Come back to that later, but already a good impression. There's no sharp edges, as we've had some. Sometimes their ship machines are just called red machines because you might cut yourself on them because the, some of the edges aren't uh, been uh, smoothed over. Now, a lot of my pictures have this little red arrow to remind you to go around in that particular order, if you like. So, um, yeah, more pictures of the front and uh, an angle shot. And uh, so if you're trying to look for some particular detail, you can zoom in and, and try and find that. Uh, around the back again, um, apart from the storage and the blowers, all the action is at the back. So, the, you know, the discs, the rise and the fans are in the front. We'll look at those in a minute. All the action is around the back in here, and we can see the adapter slots, uh, the power supplies. That's four adapter slots across here. Power supplies. Here's the service processor, the EBMC, and then we got another set of adapter slots over here. There's me taking a, a shot for the wife uh, of uh, the new machine that I was very proud of, uh, but I didn't get to make a particularly good impression when I phoned her up and set this to on the mobile phone. Um, is uh, when you get home for dinner that was the answer to that but there we are some people get computers and, and some people don't here's a detailed look as close as i as big as our picture as i can get and i've uh, highlighted everything with the arrows on off button we got the indicators power warning and identification the identification allows you to flash light on the front of the machine so make sure 
if you have you know 28 racks full of these and you know 400 machines that if you need to replace a part you actually go to the right one with a flashing light on it so you don't uh, go to uh, off by one in the rack or the position and uh, take the wrong part out um in our machine we have uh, four NVMe storage drives they're here on the uh, the left got a blanking plate we'll come back to that uh, later on USB at the front which you can um, use a memory key and boot off that uh, or you can put into that a USB uh, DVD drive um, you meant to put in DVD drives into the front of the machine that's because the USB there uh, can supply slightly more electricity because it's a DVD is a mechanical device. It requires uh, more electricity than perhaps a memory key. And there's a, this little um, thing on the far right. There's a little symbol there that says this is an earth strap, so you can plug it in there and get a solid earth if it was an Iraq. Here we are zooming in a bit to the NVMe SSDs. Um, each of those can be individually assigned to a virtual machine or an LPAR. And um, it, well, you can't quite read them. I, I can't. I got a big screen here. The first two are 100 gig, and then there's two more at 1600 uh, gigabytes SSDs. And I, I made a mistake. Uh, yeah, I don't, uh, let, I don't admit, mind admitting my mistakes. Uh, other people learn. Um, I put one of each into my two VIO servers a small one and a big one, a small one and a big one. I thought that was fair. Um, you then get into uh, volume group issues. Um, if you use the small one as the um, the uh, root VG, um, it won't let you add the big one because it needs different size uh, groups. So that the PP side needs to be bigger for the bigger disks. And the, same, the thing in the opposite happens if you put the big one into the virtual to the um, root VG first. So I should have put the two 800s and the two 1600s into the two VIO servers. So then one VIO server, and that actually works better for mirroring as well, as they're both the same size. And then uh, one of the VIO servers will have a lot of spare disk that can be mirrored. So yeah, don't follow my my uh, brilliant idea. Uh, you might get stuck like I did. If you now you know that, you probably force it to make the root of your volume group um, with bigger PP sizes so you can uh, add the bigger one later. Um, right, so th we've seen all these sorts of things before previously in the range. If you need to power, then this may be a bit strange. Um, so the NVMe storage is actually a solid state drive, as we've seen for a good few years now, uh, but connected with NVMe. That, that plugs straight into the PCIe channel. So there's no, um, not much of a, a latency going through a, a controller uh, as such as we've seen in the past. It lets the SSD go at absolute full speed. So you press a little blue triangle, it pops out, uh, you pull a handle down and you then pull that little handle and it pops up. And we'll please turn over and there's a little drive that looks fairly standard and it probably says on it, it's an SSD on it. And um, on the other side is the, uh, the, the configuration information. And it's got the connector that is at the back of the slot. Okay, now this oh, yeah, this is actually quite a, a narrow SSD in a slightly wider uh, caddy. So um, we can have the seven millimeter or 15 millimeter drives in these uh, slots. And I pressed the wrong button there. Oops. <laughs> right, I'll press the uh, down key so we do it one at a time. And uh, it's much the reverse, pushing it in and clicking it back up. It's not, not about rocket science. Now around the back, we've got uh, exhaust areas in here to let all the air flow uh, in the front of the machine and, and out the back. Yeah, lots of air flowing keeps us nice and cool inside the machine and lets us run things at a uh, high gigahertz rating and lots and lots of uh, memory. So we've got air ducts at the top. We've got the four power supplies in the middle. Um, on the bottom right, we have this is the eBMC, and I'm pointing out the USB connector for the eBMC as well. Uh, drilling in a bit, they, here's the power supplies. So you can see to the left of the power supply, it says uh, this filler is required to be used with the 80 millimeter wide 
power supplies. Now, I haven't seen any of the other power supplies that are not the ones like this, so that works quite well. And um, so we just ignore that, but they're just a little power supply. Um, 1600 watts, which is uh, uh, more capable than the Power 9 versions, and they're actually higher efficiency, they're titanium rating. So it's good for sustainability, less power is wasted in converting the mains electricity into the voltage that we actually need inside the machine. I don't think we use 12 anymore. I think there's five and one volts so on most of the uh, electronics inside. Now we're gonna lift the lid. Uh, again, there's little blue buttons. If you, you see little blue buttons, you can press those <coughs> and things happen. So you then pull up the little arm up straight and then you can just lift the lid straight up and uh, move it off. And we can see our top right, that uh, there's a, there's a little uh, um, flat head. Well, we call them nails, but they're not. They, they look like the top of a nail, and that has to go down that slot. And then when you push the lid forward, it locks in, and then you put the locking handle back down. And so we can see it going uh, doing there. And I've just put the lid to the side. I always think it, it looks a little bit like the Concorde machine with the square engines, you know, that Concorde had. Oh, maybe that's me. Okay. Let's carry on. And um, just checking my time. Yeah, we're about right. So replacing the lid. Well, there I'm, I'm lining up that uh, nail head to, so that it goes into the slot and push it down. And then when you push the little handle, it, it, move, it, it pushes the lid into the right closed position. So around the front again now, we're going to take the uh, fascia off the front. We grab the little blue handles and you just have to give it a tug. <laughs> if you didn't know that, you'd be very worried about how hard you have to pull this to get it off. But on the next slide, we'll show you how it's being held on. And you think, oh, right, yeah, just tug it off. That's going to work first time. So here it is, naked, without the, uh, the front on it. We can immediately see six fans uh, in there. So let's have a look at... Uh, uh, those, uh, they're actually called uh, blowers, they're centrifugal fans rather than a fan with a regular fan blade like you make have in your house if you're trying to keep cool. Um, and we have a uh, blanking plate for the LCD display with my machine, we'll come back to that later. And oh, in the bottom left, in tiny little writing, so old guys like me can't possibly read it without their glasses on, is the MTM, the machine type model, and the serial number. Okay. Um, oh, good point there. Even if you've bought a, a small config, you always get the full complement of uh, fans in the in the machine. Because in case you may upgrade later, you'll need them anyway. So a little blue button. You press a little blue button. It swings out slightly. You bring it out facing you, and then you've got a handle to give it a pull and the blower comes out towards you. Here you can see the centrifugal fan with the air going in the top and again pushed out uh, the back. Uh, this is particularly good because if you have a fan, a spinning fan blade, you get a lot of turbulence uh, in the air where these have a nice push in a, a general um, airflow out, out the back and in, into the machine. You can see, we can actually see the blades inside there in the, in the, in the round fan inside and the connector and uh, not much on the bottom really apart from the cables powering that up and you push that in and push the handle around to to lock it in position now if you look where those green arrows are probably the one on the left hand side it's a it's a, a metal a prong sticking out with a blob on the end and uh, on the right hand side you have these spring clips and they just as you push it on, the springs go round the blob and grip the, the, the stem of the, uh, the piece of metal, and that's what's holding it on. And so you, you did just a tug to pull it off. There's nothing, no risk of uh, breaking it as you, as you do that. So, Joe, do you any easy questions out there? I think people have been um, answering some. There's been quite a few. Um, so I think first one I can see is how is the IO bandwidth compared to power nine? I don't know if you can um, answer that succinctly, but otherwise we can take that off uh, line as it yeah, were. Well, the, the, the Gen 5 um, PCIe adapters can go at twice. It doubles every time you go through a generation. 
uh, 2 to 3, 3 to 4, and 4 to 5, it doubles the bandwidth. But of course, that depends on what the adapters you got them in, in, in the slots. So at the moment, they're all Gen 4 adapters. Um, we, there are plans to bring out some Gen 5s, Gen 5s soon. Um, so although we have the bandwidth in the machine, uh, you can't put adapters in that will actually make full use of that extra bandwidth at the moment. But uh, the, you know, the theoretical, once we get to Gen 5 adapters, it will be double the I.O. performance um, of the Power 9 generation. Thank you. Um, where, what's the difference on cooling system between Power 9 and Power 10? I think it kind of covered some of the um, airflow. Yeah, they're just fans pushing through the back of them to the machine. Um, I think some of the air goes in and comes out the front through the um, disk drives, uh, but that's the same as Power 9, and then they go past. Well, when we get look inside, you'll see the, there's airflow um, mechanisms inside to make sure that the air doesn't dodge the hot components like the uh, the heat sink for the CPUs, um, and then it goes pushed out through the adapters at the back. So it's, it's much the same as the Power 9 design. I always learn something in each generation. I got some extra clever tricks, um, mm -hmm. but uh, there's no no major sh shift. Okay, thank you. Um, are there any advantages in using the NVMe for the VIO servers compared to using a SAN, so SAN boot? No, that's that's very much uh, whatever you like. Uh, a lot of people like having um, the VO servers booting off the internal disk because then you have something to <laughs> to try to get the fiber channel working with. Um, if you can't boot the VO servers, you, know, you can't experiment and see if it's come back yet or not, and that sort of thing. Um, but a lot of people, if you've got very proactive um, SAN storage teams that know what they're doing, then, then SAN is fine. It, it's up to the user. The NVMe, of course, is very fast and probably too fast for a VO server. The VO servers don't do a lot of disk I.O. They're, they're just running device drivers after they booted, really. And we can have things like the flash cache can make, actually make use of the internal drives, but um, uh, not much else. We, we can, in smaller configurations, actually have the um, virtual disks for your LPAR, so actually a part of the root VG or on a separate volume group in the virtual IO server. That's one way of doing it as well. But um, yeah, it, it, <laughs> they all work fine. <laughs> and uh, I, in this case, I wanted to have internal disks uh, just to make sure I've, I've got some to have a look, make sure it works. And uh, we also use fiber channels as well if you want to. Okay. Um, does it, it, two Two or three more. So shall I carry on? Or? Yeah, go on. Yep. I've got one little caveat there that is if you avoid the NVMe drives in the machine, um, that will actually free up one adapter slot at the back of the machine, but we haven't covered that yet. Okay. Um, in Is the order of how to plug in the service PDUs important, AABB or ABAB? <laughs> more, more rack kind of question. To plug in the the power supplies, the the servers PDUs. Right. Yes. Uh, yes, there is an order, and you should get it right. Okay, it should be in the documentation. Right? Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, we. I did ask somebody if I got what they said. Now I think it's. No, I won't guess because I might get it wrong. Yeah, we we need to check the documentation. There is a more reliable way of doing it. Yeah, but if any one of them fails, you'll carry on running anyway. Yeah. It's only if two of them fail that then you want to have one on each of it. I actually think maybe it's actually built into the machine, so it doesn't matter now. Mm. But we'll take that as a, a frequently asked question to ask, answer later. Sure. Thank you. And um, there is a question about the uh, Ethernet adapter. So the for the S1022, um, and we may not have uh, enough information about each server, but there's a four port, one gigabit ether, ethernet adapter is not available. And um, this person, Patrick's been told that it may be available sometime soon. Well, that um, may be available office. sometime soon. I'm not commenting yeah. on that. <laughs> yeah, at the moment, I think the information is to use the two port um, EC2U, EC2T um, right. adapter, and then um, 
there there are talks of uh, four port ones being available, but we do not have any dates. We have no announcement. I, and I sort of push back on that. Yeah, you know, one gigabit network in your computer room is not much. I mean, I'm nearly getting that, that the house here, right? <laughs> um, it's, you should really be buying a machine now to go to 10 gigabit rapidly and have matching um, uh, switches to, to plug into. You can, there's, there's an adapter that's a 10 and 25 gigabit. Yeah, that's the EC2, EC2T. Right. You can buy a little uh, adapter that will take it down to one gigabit if that's all you've got. That's right. Yeah, the SFPs that you yes, it, you yes. can detect. Yeah, you can determine which uh, speed you want to go at uh, depending on which uh, SFPs you're ordering. Yep. Um, front USB is this built in or an optional extra requiring additional hardware? It's built in. And then one um, one more um, RMDME modules hot pluggable in the Power Ten servers. Uh, yes, the, all the storage is hot pluggable in the power 10. Okay, there's quite a few more that have come in, but I think we'll move on in the yep. interest okay. of time and then we'll try and handle these either at the end or take them away into the frequently asked questions um, session Nigel mentioned. Okay, right, we'll okay. continue on. Only 120 slides to go, okay. Um, so you take the lid off, this is what you get. You have, this is called an air dam inside the machine. This um, forces the air down to go th actually through the memory and through the power supply. So the uh, heat sinks on top of the CPUs there. And then it's released at the back and it can flow out through the adapters um, or actually over the top of the adapters um, by those vents that we saw at the back of the machine. Oh, here's another, another view of it. You can sort of get a hint of what's uh, down below. <laughs> can you see? Can you can you see my pointer, JT? I can see a small um, pointer. Smudge. Okay. Yeah, that's a reflection of something on the ceiling. There's nothing in the computer. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry about that. Here's another view straight down, and here me here's me marking them all up. The uh, memory uh, slots. We, we uh, looked around the machine, and um, instead of thirty two adapter slots, we could only find twenty six. So we thought. That's a really odd number, but there's some some extra memory uh, slots here and here in the machine that we are covered up by something in front of it. So we, it actually does actually add up to 32 slots in the back of the machine. Again, we've got uh, NVMe adapters at the back, the power suppliers, the BMC. At the top right, you can see an adapter just has a lot of, uh, a black sort of a ladder <laughs> sort of thing next to it. We'll look at that in a minute, but that is the NVMe adapter that plugs into the NVMe storage drives at the front of the machine and we'll follow the cable around later on. Uh, no obvious place to lift it up, but there was a nice, nice block near the middle at the back and this black thing, so I said, well, that must be the handle then, let's use those to, to pick it up. Uh, it would be interesting if somebody's actually got the, the GA version of it. Uh, in previous machines, generations we've we got a clear plastic one which they thought was great and, and highly recommended it and it turned out that it came in jet black when it actually arrived at customers they couldn't see through it and uh, so it'd be fun if somebody could tell me what's actually been shipped this is uh looking at the top you can see this uh, dam going down at the front to make sure that the air coming in the front actually goes through that first bank of memory and then we're looking uh, around the machine um so we, yeah we, all, underneath these black covers is all the memory there's two banks either side i think it's 12 each or something there's another bank in the middle and there's an extra bit of memory on the the, the, the top and the bottom in this picture this is me um pointing out something that i don't recall but, uh, okay um at the bottom right we see three bright green stickers this is one end of the NVMe cables going into this little piece of uh, motherboard that the disks actually plug into the, um, from the other side. Yeah, and I'm pointing out the various places where the memory is hiding uh, as well. So let's carry on. Um, all the memory is very clearly numbered, which is, which is excellent. If you have something fail, then um, it will put an LED next to the number and I'm telling you, it's this one that's failed. I'm actually put out the right one. Um, we're also looking down in the middle of the machine 
we have the vital product data. We used to call it lollipop because that was the shape of it. But this has the uh, the feature codes for the activating particular uh, parts of the machine. If you paid for them, then they'll be activated. And this is the, the device that handles that. And you can see next to it, there's actually the um, the battery. Exciting piece of technology. Worth nearly sort of three euro dollar pounds. But, you know, it's a real pain when they do fail and they can't remember what time of day it is or what year it is even. Now the next bit, a uh, big warning in here. I, I did something and got quite told off uh, about it. The um, memory, the OMI memory in all the Power 10 machines is for our CEs, our customer engineers or SSRs as they're called now, um, to remove, add or replace. It's not for customers to do that. And you may well, if you get it wrong, actually damage your Power 10 processors. I can't express that more clearly than that. And so you have been warned, you're not meant to be in there fiddling. Of course, me being who I am, I went in there and fiddled about with the memory and I got away with it. <laughs> they were very relieved, otherwise they're gonna to have to send me a new machine. Um, but uh, I got away with it. I think I got away with it because the static electricity had disappeared because it take, took uh, two and a half weeks in, in two planes to arrive in London. Uh, and so uh, there wasn't any static electricity still inside the machine. Uh, here, here's a look at uh, dealing with the memory. Remember, you're not doing this, right? As uh, a plastic cover, it clips in and out. It's very simple. You can't really get it wrong as long as you get it the right way around. And it's got these little fans here and, uh, and the arrows to tell you that's that's the direction the air should be flowing from front to back. Uh, that's another way of looking at it. Here's me looking down at the slot that the memory actually goes into. Uh, completely new uh, sort of slot. You know, none of your you know, DDR4 type memory will slot into that at all. These are OMI memory slots. And uh, the, the controller means we can talk to the memory much faster. Um, the DDR4 protocol is, I'm told by the, the, the guys that designed for it, uh, is ghastly uh, in, in how you talk to it and persuade it to accept an, another uh, um, cache line of memory going into it where the our special controller here has very high speed simple protocols and it buffers it so it'll catch it anyway even if it wasn't expecting it and, and uh, deal with the uh, putting the the bits actually into the chips at a slightly later stage and so this is how we managed to speed up the machine drastically so here i'm taking one machine one of them out you just grab once the top is off the covers and you grab hold of it give it a little pull and up it comes and I've got some pictures of them uh, here. There's two of them, the front and the back. And the uh, the gold thing is the controller underneath here. The, these are actually 4U high, but there's only 2U of it being used in here. There are some smaller cars like this uh, that don't have the bit at the top, um, and they are fit into the S1022 type models because then they haven't got the height for the extra bit of card. Um, when so we go back one, and um, when the uh, maximum size memory dims are available or OMI cards are available, then there, there's chips all over these to get the extra uh, size of memory dim. So here we go, looking at the um, really pretty actually. I thought um, the heat sinks on top of the CPUs. Uh, underneath each of these CPUs, there's uh, a ceramic. Um, a ceramic with two power 10 chips in it so that they dual chip module that you actually put into the machine and a great big heat sink on top i presume the copper here is to draw out a maximum amount of uh, uh, heat and then it's got uh, aluminium or some sort of alloy at the top um, to actually spread that out uh, into the airflow coming past the machine uh, here's uh, looking from the heat sinks to out the back and you can see the uh, the stack of power supplies and there's uh, yeah there's a metal cage between the two this is <laughs> a joke but you know we can't trust these adapter guys uh, they may be spraying they may be spraying um, um high frequency radiation at the back of the machine so we'll protect our power 10 processors by having a faraday cage so that they're not affected by the uh, radio frequency um, messages coming off the adapters and then you have a similar thing down at the back here and there's all sorts of regulations isn't there of the um of how much radioactivity you a machine actually can actually generate um and be fit for 
use in a computer room. And that's why we have so much metal uh, around the machine. And uh, we can see that here there's a uh, PCIe slots uh, 0 to 11, but there's only 10 slots. That's because in C5 is actually the eBMC controller, the new uh, service processor. Moving on, here's the power supplies. Uh, we've got nice Velcros around the handles uh, so you can lock on the cables so that they don't fall off, particularly if it's high up in the machine and you've got a heavy cable uh, running down. Um, We've seen these th things before, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time here. You grab the handle and the, and the blue button and give it a push when the cable's out. Um, and then you use the handle to give it a tug and pull it out. And um, we've seen these sort of things before. These are titanium, so they're much more efficient, uh, wasting less electricity, part of the sustainability of uh, new machines. Uh, this is an interesting label on top of the uh, power supply. There's, there's various... Um, bolts that you put in to lock in the various components and they come in three different sizes and then the the round square and triangle tell you which ones go in which place so you don't put a a, a small one into a long hole and think hey, it, won't, it won't grip at the end because it's too short and you, you get them uh, all in the right place in the first attempt i presume that we're putting a label on this because people have had problems with this uh, maybe the ce's are being confused in here is the uh, the ebmc in slot five uh, i forgot to take it out and have a look maybe it's just as well but um there it is we also have these voltage regulator modules um these were in power nine uh, i think a lot of them were on the motherboard were in the bigger machines there are separate things like we have now in power 10 scale out so if one of those um, fails you can swap them over quite uh, quickly you can lift them out two little handles unclip and you lift them out a lot of copper on the connection here because um if you think about the the uh, watts that's going in the cpus there are running i have no idea what it is but say it's 100 watts and it's the electricity is going in at one volt there, then that's a uh, 100 amps of current going down those there's connectors, so there's a lot of copper involved to make sure that they don't get hot. And uh, these these voltage regulator modules are meant to commit suicide rather than letting a a, um, you know, a voltage spike go through to the processor. Uh, the, the VRMs are relatively cheap compared to the CPUs, so they'll commit suicide and the machine will stop. Um, and then we can just replace this rather than having to replace the main processor, which is a much more complicated um procedure and more costly so there's a whole bunch of these around um, some for the memory some for the cpus and uh, we'll carry on this is putting the air baffle back on you want to make sure that it ends up uh, flat to the the metal surrounds um, otherwise you will have problems getting the lid back on top so here's the uh, nvme pcie adapter that's a mouthful isn't it and we're looking down at the top of it here it's it's low at the back of the machine and rises to the back because there's uh, four cables that connect into the back of it and then we follow those around the uh, the cage and then go down the back slot and then they rise back up and there's the four green labels that we talked about earlier on there's an extra little cable in there I, i'm not sure what it is <laughs> to be honest maybe it's a power cable or something or an indicator um, and these go straight into the back of the nvme storage drives devices okay and there they are at the front uh, just as a reminder of how they get connected i've only got four so we would only have one of these nvme adapters if you had more than eight nvme uh, slots no drives at the front then you'd have two nvme adapters uh, at the back of the machine taking up two slots if you're using fiber channel discs then you don't need any of those and you you, you gain one slot I guess just a tour around the back of the machine, looking at the various connectors. The two slots there going to the two uh, HMCs. Right, quick test. Uh, which server is this? Um, I've covered up the label so you can't guess. Uh, yeah, I think that's right. So uh, I'll just continue. I'm trying to do this in a room with the hands up, but uh, it's the 1024 at the bottom. They do look pretty similar. You can see this thing in the middle of the power nine is moved uh, uh, lower down between the two fans. In this case, and the USB moved. 
but not a lot else. Right, now into the computer room. Remember the box on the top of the inside of the box? Uh, these are the, the rails, and we get very excited about rails. Um, we've seen dozens of different designs over the years, and uh, I can honestly say these are the best rails I've ever come across. We've seen them once, I think, in Power 9 as well. Um, very simple to do without looking at the instructions. You sometimes have uh, some that will, will take a chunk of flesh out with a vampire connectors and we've seen some that uh, take uh, you know four people 30 minutes to install having to hold the front and back at the same time uh, this is very simple to install now why do we go on about this well if you buy a hundred s1024s and you're going to put those into you know 10 racks or something then um you've got a lot of rack rails that you have to install and if this takes 30 seconds instead of three minutes well you just save yourself two weeks of menial tasks inside the computer room and you can get going getting your installation uh, up and running nicely noted look front right of the here and uh, the, these little things um, if you've got round holes in your rails then it will use this part if you've got square holes then the next bit of it comes out and uh, locks it nice and firmly into the square hole racks okay so here's a little note where they're doing it at the front you pull this uh, lever out sideways to get this out of the way then you can get it up and you can see it's gone through the round hole because proper racks have round holes by the way no, everybody knows that um and then you let go of that and it springs around and locks in and you go pop around the back and then you put the uh, the bolts in to to lock it in place ready for the machine here they are nicely slid out and we can see that the here's the flat head that goes into this one two three four of them for this machine various pictures there of the machine hanging out as always worries me sometimes that uh, it's going to break but they never do and then we put the covers in and we put our labeling up uh, cable management arms um these are uh, nicely organized i think I, I did check they're pretty much identical to the power nine cable management arms and so here it is in here with the um the great big fat uh power cables in here we always put those in at the bottom of the cable management arm and then the more delicate fiber channels and ethernets go on top now i've got a big cross in here so this is my this is power uh yeah similar to power nine this is the actually this is the power 10 machine as it went in i've got a series of pictures in here because the power 9 one i didn't retake really these pictures i always think this is like a praying mantis or a crab or something but the problem with that is it's upside down it should be that way around and you look at it you this goes into one side and you've got two connectors that go into the other side and you think how on earth is that going to work and the trick is you know, the, the three connectors go in like this and the trick is if you watch it carefully as it goes out this bit slides down this rod out to the end and spreads all out. If you hadn't worked that out, you, you'd swear this is never going to work and not even try pulling it forward. Uh, this is uh, it with all the cables in as well. This is, um, yes, yeah, this is the Power 9 machine. You can see the service processors over here. Yeah. We, we could play the, uh, we'll name this server in one sort of games by looking at pictures like that. So we've got this little area in here. And we said, well, that's, that's a bit of a shame. We didn't get one of them. Um, I think we were asked, but we didn't know what it was, so we didn't order it. So um, we asked, could we have the LCD uh, display unit to go in here? The idea is you don't want need one per machine. They recommend one per rack um, because they're, they're not used very often. They can be used as a techno stunt. Somebody can actually press the buttons, about 40 of them presses over the button and you can actually put an IP address on your service processor I think well we use DHCP we don't have to bother with that um, but it is useful if you have a machine that will not actually boot at all some diagnostics will come out on, on that device and you can hot plug them so we asked them for for this one <coughs> and they said sure yeah, we'll, we'll ship one of those to you and uh, they shipped us one of these <laughs> So this is the LED lights and there's the LED display, so or LCD display. We got the wrong one, and the part number of them is almost identical, so it's easily done. So we got a spare one. I don't know what we're going to do with it. Um, and they've sent us the, the right one next, and um, 
in one of my videos on YouTube actually shows my my CE or SSR um, one handedly putting the new one in. They just pop in and out. They're not not uh, not uh, technically difficult. When you pop it in, it starts a little round like a ball swings around the outside so it's warming up and then it starts working so that's the top of the uh, machine and it's uh, this is not my machine uh we're, we're very tempted to buy it um and uh, the esp has sent me a team early ship program team to send me this and it's sitting in the hersey hyperscale data center great guys there uh, helping us hosting a machine as a, and as a far cast of hundreds i mean i only got to know some of these people but of course i don't know what it is two or three hundred people have actually can put uh, their hand in and designing a, a new machine all the various parts and components and the software and proving the quality and you know, all, all all of a big long team to get um, really really nice computers so that's uh, part two done with we're going to look at uh, hmc and the bmc uh, itself uh, logging in to give them a go right nigel just one second um i just wanted to highlight that um we've got andrew laidlaw uh, on the session and he's been doing a grand job of answering a lot of the questions in the chat Good man. Uh, andrew uh was uh oh he's an author of one of the red books i posted links to both red books so the scale out servers red book andrew was involved in uh, writing that up uh, and I also posted the link for the E1050 red book. Well, it's good to know he's there because he's probably correcting all my mistakes. <laughs> Not at all, uh, but he has been adding to uh, or answers to many of the questions that we haven't yet read out. So, okay, great. So thanks, Andrew. And uh, yeah, but Nigel, in the interest of time, we've got about half an hour yeah. just under. Feels so I'll let right. you crack on. Okay, HMC. Right. Now, the HMC for Power 10 machines have to run version or release 7 of the HMC software. Now, they, they match it up, right? As we make a new machine, we make new software for the HMC to manage it. And the HMC can also manage two earlier generations. So, as you can see at the top, the HMC software version 9 can, can connect to a 7, an 8, or a 9 server. So, when we go up to HMC 10, uh, it will manage power eight, power nine, and power ten. Uh, so the question is, what happens to the power seven machines that are connected when you upgrade the HMC uh, software? Well, first of all, we actually plugged a power ten machine into a HMC running version seven of the software, and it just said, "I have no idea what that is." <laughs> it would come up with a you know, great big round. Uh, red ring around it, then something connected. I don't know what it is. Um, so if you then upgrade your HMC to from nine to ten, and I recently did this. Uh, Gareth used to do all this for me, so I'm having to remember how to do it. I was a bit of a novice. Uh, surprisingly easy, actually. If you got Power Nine, it's a, about an hour. Uh, bring down the, you know, download the image and say it's over there on our FTP server, and it did everything itself first time. Um, so when it's get Power Nine software goes to power 10 software it will disown the power 7 machines it was a no idea what that is not my problem so unless you've got a another hmc that can control the power 7 machines you're in a problem then you can't start stop or change your power 7 machines um and uh yeah so um and if you do that and the power 10 was connected to it it will now say oh yes i i've Got a fancy new power 10 server there i know what to do with that and we'll connect up and you're into managing your, your brand new server if you uh, got the hmc at power 10 and you plug in the power 10 it all works as you'd expect it recognizes it and then you have to uh, log in to the uh, the service processor um, and set a password if you want to not use the defaults which is sort of recommended for security um, and, and off you go you're running it as normal now the current HMC is a is the seventy sixty three CR two, and a very nice uh, HMC it is too. The older ones, the CR ones, I still have three, I think, of them, and, and they're fine. They can run the uh, the Power Ten software on the HMC, so they can connect to uh, eight, nine, and ten. And I have an older HMC that I use for a, a couple of old Power Seven machines. They're sort of separated into my uh, museum piece now. 
Uh, but those tended to be controlled by older Intel or x86 based HMCs, and they were pretty slow. Um, and they don't have a lot of memory, and they're sort of largely historic now. Um, I would uh, basically throw them out <laughs> uh, or use them um, for running a website or uh, put them in your power systems museum at one end of your computer room if you like curating old machines uh, at the weekends. So that's my opinion. You, you <laughs> differ to, so, to my general approach there. I actually worked this chart out for a big customer they're still running power six machines it's like it's really embarrassing my guys and so um i was looking at the 32 cpu machines and they've got power six with 32 cpus in them and i, I was looking at the on the right hand side you know that they, they have six rpers per core and those 32 when machines were pretty near the top end There's, there was one slightly bigger machine i think it's the 595 um, well, is it a mainframe rack? Is a whopping great big thing. You open the door and it looked like an industrial dishwasher inside. Six upper. So then down through the generations, we're now at our scale out machine. What was a top end machine went to the middle range, and now the actual scale out machine can run 32 CPUs. Um, and um, it's running an awful lot faster per core. Uh, they were a bit shocked when they saw these numbers. Because um, we we're going to upgrade them, and I was saying, do you want to go five times faster, ten times faster, twenty times faster than you're currently running? They didn't understand that computers have moved on since they bought their Power Six machine. So another game just for fun in here. Which one's a CR9? Which is a CR1? Which is a CR2? Now you notice the Intel it was a previous naming convention. It'll eventually get up to CR9s in the power ones, I guess. So which one's which? Which one is the, the CR2? I've given you a hint already about which machine it is. And it's... The... What happened then? <laughs> oh, it's here in grey. This is the CR2. And I was joking with another customer saying, it's far prettier than the old machines, the CR1s down here. This looks pretty ugly. And this looks pretty nice. The CR2s don't actually come out on rails. You just lock them in on a, on a shelf because uh, all the bits come out the front and the back. So you don't need to slide it out to do any maintenance. So just by the way, they're really nicely engineered CR2s is what you should aim at. Here's looking at the CR, um, the code, the version 9 code has this sort of look to it. So then we got a new look and feel. Wow, that was worth all the hard work upgrading, wasn't it? <laughs> there we go. I'm pulling your leg. Now, before we go and look at that to the HMC, and let's just hope this works because it can all fall pear shape at this point. We'll finish early, that'll be good. Um, we had get, can get a little bit confusing, right? You've got a HMC, or two HMCs in this, you know, dual HMCs, normal. And uh, from out of the HMC, you plug that into this, what used to be called the FSP, Flexible Service Processor. It's now called the EBMC port. So that hasn't changed, and the EBMC is just the new name for FSP. Um, it uh, you can't take an SFP out and put a BMC in. It's completely different connectors and things, but it's performing exactly the same sort of role. It's connecting to the HMCs in the same sort of way. HMCs are doing DHCP normally to give it IP addresses, and, and off you go. Um, so don't, don't expect some revolutionary new thing. It's doing the same job. Uh, slightly better technology. We, we're piggybacking the open source community that are writing the BMC code so that we don't do it by ourselves. We can just use that in our own products. And uh, this makes it common with uh, other vendors and things. Now, the EMC, EBMC product engineer, Top Gun, Russ Young, has created a bunch of uh, YouTube, no, they're not, they're in mediacenteribm.com. I'm all about the EBMC, and I was going to try and cover some of the things that he's covered in the videos, but just go and watch that. He's got uh, how to configure a bit EBMC if you're going to use DHCP, or if you haven't got a HMC, or upgrading the firmware um, on the B EBMC, and a whole bunch of other tasks in there as well. All carefully complained. And there is one extra step in here where you have to they got an extra sort of piece of functionality running on the HMC that, sorry, on the eBMC that you have to set a new password for. And if you don't do that, all sorts of strange things happen and you can't uh, move forward. Um, in the very long term, the 
they're going to make a, a backup mechanism for the EBMC. So if it failed, we have a, another functionality running on the main processes that can, can take over and let you carry on until you can take the machine down. But that's future. I maybe shouldn't have told you that. But um, so we have, a, we have a server, an S1024, with an EBMC port in it. We have a HMC, which is actually based on power nine <laughs> get this it has an ebmc in it but we're not talking about that one that's like really embedded in the hmc you're not usually aware of that of what's going on now this is where it's all going to go horribly wrong and um i have to get right out of here move that out of the way and here's my HMC. I'm hoping you can all see that. Yeah, yeah. showing up. <laughs> this, this doesn't look too good, does it? I've got eight machines in here, all starting starting at F1. This is a, a HPC cluster of uh, Formula One nodes. They're all um, S1022s, and uh, we've they just arrived. And uh, Steve Mitchell's uh, putting a red hat on them. And he's doing a native install, not having it virtualized. So the HMC feels that it should be talking to it, but it can't. Uh, so ignore that for now. That's a work in progress of uh, putting the um, Red Hat uh, 9 on it. Um, we've got some power 8, some power 9s, and here we go. This is my um, S1024. You probably have worked that out already. And it's known as gold. We just give them colors to our machines and because it's the best one it's gold of course that's the next one i'll have to be platinum so this is the new hmc interface i think the last one of the hmc 9 software looked uh, a bit like this um, but we can everything's <laughs> the icons are different but it's all going to work uh, roughly the same we're in systems if we click on here we can go into the um partitions that are running on here there's another bit of the formula one pre-prototype testing that we had running um taking up the whole machine um and we got some various pieces bits and pieces running on here um i'm just trying to think where do we want to go next okay uh virtual i servers there's one for all of them and uh here's gold one and two and uh as you'd expect if we go back into systems and gold i want to go down the list in here this all looks should be fairly familiar so we've got uh, general settings in here rather than looking at the partitions on it we've got uh, and the toilets i've been using this for six months so i just think this is completely normal uh now but so, something that uh, are new you've got the ip addresses here and the the um serial numbers and things in here then uh general properties yeah we've got migration properties in here um and uh and we got power on parameters down in here just just to give you a little look of what's actually available with some of these uh panels so this is the more advanced stuff uh huge memories in here oh we have um oh we, we haven't got the uh active memory mirroring uh, for the hypervisor mirroring on our machine uh, here yet. If we go and look at the processors, we can see we have uh, 32 CPUs, 20 assigned, 13 uh, not assigned at the moment, or uh, are available, and yeah, I ignore that for now. Uh, memory, uh, we've got 512 gigabytes of memory, and physical adapters. I sometimes get asked, people like to see this. Um, so it, it, ethernet and this nvme card that's the adapter slot at the back of the machine in slot 10. Um, oh then if we go down here are the actual nvme um discs the storage themselves so each one of these can be assigned to a different logical partition so we got uh, two of them for gold vo server one vo server two's only got one because we gave the other disc to running uh, Red Hat as a, a single image um, in the machine. Um, what else we got? Virtual networks are all much the same as you might expect. In here, we just got one, nice and simple. I've got virtual switches as well as, as you're used to. 
not really sure what else we can go into. In here, we can do uh, uh, all the operations like uh, power off, as is already on, and uh, we can do things like launch the active advanced memory management system. We're going to look at that in a minute. That's how we connect to the eBMC. Um, but uh, I think this is all generally uh, what you'd expect. We have persistent memory here. This is for SAP HANA in particular. There shouldn't be any there assigned. So that uh, is memory we keep running and available. Um, even if your SAP HANA gets taken down, it can start up and reconnect to that bank of memory. Looks like a very fast disk system. Okay. We go back to uh, here, back into the machine, and we didn't call one out, good. Um, and we can do the, the usual sorts of things. Um, <laughs> so randomly selecting something so we can uh, activate it here. And it says, do you wanna start up what it was last running? Finish that. Not going to wait for it to finish. We can do things like this is probably not going to work actually, but uh, unclick that. We can do here to mobility. I used it straight for the validate. Uh, yes, Mike Lee, I think we got a SAP HANA certification here. This is going to do um, LPM, live partition mobility, uh, you know, Star Trek hyperspace jump onto a power nine machine and that's it validate it may not let me do that because it may be <laughs> yes it's in power 10 mode and i can't go to a power nine machine i'd have to bounce that uh, virtual machine to do that but all this is working as expected uh, so i can't do that today or Shit. <laughs> where was it in here No, I was looking for advanced, it was in general. Oh, somewhere in here, I lost it. <clears throat> I can change from power nine to power, power 10 to power nine code. There is it in here, processors. Oh, it's down here. Oh, yeah, I've lost it. I have to go and find it sometime. Right, the, another thing we want to go then is look at the, the eBMC interface. So we'll go into uh, here, operations, launch, advanced systems management. <coughs> the beta version said launch eBMC management in here, but we changed it back to the original name because say people get lost. Phew, right, it came up. Uh, we've lost an image here. I'm, I'm not sure what's going on there. Maybe there's a... An upgrade for me to take some time. I'll log in. All oh, fingers on it when you try to do something quickly. Okay. Here we go. Wow, that's nice and quick. I keep getting asked um, if you talk to the eBMC that's on the HMC, you can mount a remote ISO image, but we can't do that uh, with this EMC because we're in eBMC, we're not <laughs> going to let you install your choice of operating system onto the service processor in an expensive server. That's going to be too problematic. So let's give you some information in here. Uh, the service logins are done differently. You have to go and get a certificate rather than the password and uh, upload that to get access to the, uh, you know, sort of nearly root access to the uh, service processor. Uh, you can see here it's using 820 watts. Uh, these are the keys that you manage to get access to it. Wow, that makes a change. Look, nothing wrong with it. Uh, having early machines, you tend to expect a few things are going wrong. We have a whole bunch of things in here. There's just health at the top here. Not, not much to click up here. It's all driven off these uh, menus. So in operations, we can see various things. Uh, we can reboot it. The uh, 
uh, or do an orderly shutdown, or we can do a um, maintenance. Uh, what happens when it powers off? Automatically power off as well, uh, or when it starts up, automatically once the restart the uh, server. Don't wait for a, a system admin guy to turn up. We've got the console. I don't think that's going to work because uh, that's the low level console for the eBMC, which has already come past that and is running the uh, server now. We've got firmware upgrades in here. So this means it's telling us that we need to switch the server off to upgrade the eBMC service processor, which is normal for a scale out machine. And this is the, how you do it if it's powered off. Uh, reboot it. Yeah, it's not very exciting, is it? Resource management. We've got lots of things we can do in here. The logical memory block size, the LMB. Um, for all power 10, they're going to be this, and, and eventually they'll go up to bigger numbers. The quarter gigabyte is the smallest chunk of memory you can allocate um, out to your uh, virtual machines. Just big memory. This is for some particular adapters and active memory. Uh, mirroring, you got power in here. Oh, these are the power savings. Oh, running in max performance mode. That's what we want, isn't it? Um, and uh, you see that we've we've gone up one watt since I started running this screen is taxing it <laughs> I'm joking uh, power saving options in here about how long it waits before it, it it takes you into power saving and how long it takes before it will take you out of power saving so it can ignore very short transitory jumps in requirements capacity on demand there's nothing in there at the moment we've got a whole load of things uh, the vet codes and things that we can switch on in here. Um, yeah, we can uh, switch off cores if we wanted to. Can't imagine why. Maybe the benchmark center would like to do that sometimes. Uh, we've got a lateral cast out, cast out control. No idea what that means. I don't know why I pressed the button. Uh, we've got inventory. We can look at what's actually inside the machine. You see this blue bar? It's, it's building up the rest of the page. Okay, then we've got uh, the manager, the chassis, the dims. Uh, they will look okay. We can switch the LED next to a dim if um, if it's not on and we want to find out which one's which. Here's all the the memory dim. Well, they're not all full, so that's memory slots rather than actual memory. Um, fans, yep, yeah, power supplies, processors, uh, various bits and pieces inside the machine connecting things up. We're all down there. I'm not going to spend them some time we've got some sensors i haven't actually delved into this but again it says it takes a few minutes to go around finding all its sensors i've got a way to find out all the the uh, the energy in watts and temperatures another way and we got hardware deconfig we can take memory out and processors out if we wanted to and i don't think logs has got much in it either It change all right setting this down in here <clears throat> it's a bit of a shame this is where you probably most want to go like time of date for example if that's wrong this is uh 20 past two what yeah this is ut see and uh, i'm operating um british summertime network details in here we can add static things uh and a factory reset don't do that by accident and we've got access it's the most interesting things at the bottom because it stopped with s i guess it's alphabetical to help you find it so we got uh, user management and here i created my own user so i can uh, not use the standard one most of the time okay so that's all we got in there to show a little show of what's going on there's nothing to be scared of in here the um Except it didn't seem to log out. Let's try again. Yeah, it's not working. Okay. <laughs> I've seen it take a little while for it to log me out, but we'll ignore that and we'll go uh, get rid of these things and uh, come back here. We've got some time for some uh, questions. Yeah. Um, again, Andrew's been answering quite a lot of those already. So. 
Um, I think what we'll do is gather up the ones, all of the questions, yeah. including ones that haven't been answered, and we'll, we'll just take those offline. Okay. I just wondered it might be useful um, to see the energy stuff that you were talking about uh, earlier, if if it's kind handy. Of, yeah, part of the blessings of having these brand new machines, I get to play with the latest stuff. So I've got uh, some tools called N-Extract that pulls the data out of the HMC REST API. I can honestly say it's the most complicated API I've ever seen by a factor of 10. Um, but I managed to get a, a Python package that will actually make it simple to pull out the information. Uh, and one of the things I've been doing is with the scale out machines, we can get the electrical power watts consumption and we can get the inlet temperature. This is the computer room temperature. It's good to check that. If your machine's getting hot, it might be the whole computer room getting hot, not, to, not just yours. We also have some, some temperature sensors on the, the planar. I guess one's near the front and one's near the back. I wouldn't know. And then we get a whole bunch of information about the uh, CPUs. Now, if I go back to... <laughs> uh here and click on here this is actually uh live from the, the gold machine in the past 30 minutes and you can see the temperature going up again and don't worry about this because the bottom isn't zero this is again from 816 to 820 watts up in here but we get some nice diagrams in here if I go down this sort of bird's nest sort of looking thing that they've got um three sensors in each core in a 32-way machine and then there's another 12 sensors which are in what it's called the nest it's like the caches and the interfaces to your memory and to your pcie um so we actually end up with 112 uh temperatures in here whoa look at that it's, it's suddenly gone up i don't know why um so we can actually monitor pull this information down and uh, and get to find out what's going on with our machine. We can see we could get the watts by logging into to the uh, service processor, but you don't want to do that to 50 different machines in your computer room, do you, every day? I, I've also done this one. This is looking at the difference in temperatures. So at the moment, these are the temperatures, uh, the differences. So you, here, look, we've got one CPU 58 is six degrees warmer than the rest. A bit odd because a minute ago, it was five degrees colder than the rest. Uh, so that didn't help me very much, but uh, I've also put the graphs in here about the with, with zeros in. So even though it looks like it was going up like mad, it's actually going up a couple of degrees and been coming down a couple of degrees, uh, wavering around the 800 watts sort of uh, number. The, the computer room temperature actually has gone from uh, 20 to slightly higher up. What's that? Uh, 22. It's not much, is it? The, uh, the sun's come out uh, on the windows or something. And we can see a temporary glitch is going back up and down in here. But if we start doing longer and longer periods, this <laughs> this graph looks really like noise, isn't it? Really, we zoom back over here. It's really complicated. But we can say if we had a big pipe spike, we could sort of drill into that particular part and have a look at how high it went. Uh, but haven't got at the moment any description about what those 112 <laughs> sensors are. And which ones are CPUs and uh, which ones are, are Nest and those sorts of things. But it is interesting tracking that. I'm due to give a demo on September the 13th um, with um, having two very quiet machines and starting an LPAR up on Power 9, and then moving it to Power 10. And the program, it, it already does this, it goes twice as fast when it gets to Power 10, which is very impressive. Uh, it's a multi threaded application. Um, and then the idea is to see that the the uh, power nine will be using you know 20 watts to run that LPAR, and when it gets to power 10 it's only going to run i don't know 15 watts it's showing that we're using less electricity but going twice as fast well that's the plan if you can join us in london on september the 13th do come along yes good point nigel i will add the registration link to that event in the replay email i send out um after this session uh, hopefully later later on today uk time um thank you so much for taking us on a real kind of whiz of a tour through s1024 the ebmc hmc and also your um, heat graphs um 
there we're kind of at the top or the bottom of the hour uh, where we should really stop so thank you everyone very much for joining and i'm sorry we didn't get to all the questions but thanks to andrew he's answered andrew laidlaw has answered quite a lot of them already we will capture the chat capture all the questions and um, make sure that they are covered in uh, a future session which is most likely in the power systems bug um, session being planned with nigel okay okay i'm just going to stop the recording now